Welcome, I'm Kelly Reidenauer, Associate Director of Design at Trees Atlanta, and we're standing in the Beltline Arboretum Stumperary Garden, located on the Atlanta Beltline Eastside Extension Trail in the Reynoldstown neighborhood, just north of Kirkwood Avenue. The Atlanta Beltline is a transit corridor connecting 45 different neighborhoods through Atlanta across 22 miles. The entire corridor is also a certified arboretum, a free public garden where you can learn about trees. The arboretum is home to over 4,000 newly planted trees that join the existing forest across 45 acres of meadow. The arboretum is also interconnected with gardens, like this one, the Stumperary Garden, that are urban forest learning hotspots. Stumperary Gardens is a real term. It's an intentional arrangement of woody material like tree stumps, trunks, and branches. And the first known stumperary was built in 1856 and created by artist and gardener Edward William Cook. Cook was an English painter known for iconic seascape paintings. However, Cook had an interest in natural history. In fact, a boa constrictor native to the Caribbean was named in Cook's honor. Cook was enlisted to help his friend, James Bateman, a famous horticulturalist known for orchid cultivation, along with his wife, Maria Bateman, a botanist, design and build the now famous gardens at Bidoff Grange in North Staffordshire. At that time, extensive land clearing left woody debris and Cook saw an opportunity to reuse the material. The piles were turned into towering stump-adorned walls flanking either side of the garden pathways and planted with ferns. The various nooks and crannies between root and stump pieces created the perfect environment to grow ferns. Ferns were a growing fashion during the Victorian era. This fern fever was even given a name, pteridomania. Ferns adorned metalwork, gravestones, artwork, just to name a few and fern collecting and hunting was wildly popular. Charles Kingsley described this movement in his book, Glaucus, or The Wonders of the Shore. What he wrote reads, Your daughters, perhaps, have been seized with the prevailing pteridomania and wrangling over unpronounceable names of species, which seem different in each new fern book that they buy, and yet you cannot deny that they find enjoyment in it, and are more active, more cheerful, more self-forgetful over it than they would have been over novels and gossip, crochet, and Berlin wool. With the fern craze rampant, it is no surprise that the idea of a stumperary garden immediately caught on and became common features of late 19th century gardens. These upturned roots were just the perfect scaffolding to display a home fern collection, sometimes lovingly referred to as ferneries. Victorian gardens during this time were eclectic and favored showcasing unique plants from all around the world, which made gardens appear enchantingly wild. This garden style was a stark transition from the 18th century capability brown style landscapes. These landscapes featured sweeping lawns planted with isolated groupings of trees, all done to make the landscape appear larger. These late 19th century Victorian gardens, which included stumperaries, influenced the arts and crafts movement, which gave us the bountiful overflowing cottage gardens in the early 20th century. These wild gardens of the 20th century disappeared due to a range of factors, which included war, bringing on social and economic changes, urbanization, modern design, which favors clean lines, as well as the successful mass production of the motorized lawnmower. All of this contributed to the extinction of the Victorian and cottage gardens. With it went the stumperary. However, stumperary gardens are becoming popular again, the most famous belonging to Prince Charles at Highgrove Estate, which was built in 1980. And the largest stumperary was built at the rhododendron species botanical garden in Washington state, in 2009. While stumperaries are still rare horticultural oddities, they also align with the cultural gardening shifts we see today. 
we are favoring gardens that repair damages of the most destructive aspects of urban and suburbanization. For example, community gardens, which bring us food, wildlife habitat gardens to bring back pollinators, xeriscaping and rain gardens, both done with intentions to be responsible about water use. We strive to make our homes, gardens, and landscapes not just beautiful, but beneficial. So how does using dead wood in a landscape help? You might think of a forest as lush, green, full of life and health. While this is true, a forest requires death to survive. Without dead wood, a forest is just not the same. In recent history, we have managed our forests for timber products. For traditional timber products, you want to grow straight wood, thin the forest, and cut out any of the disease. While this is good for reliable timber production, the rest of the ecosystem that relies on trees across a variety of ages suffers. An undisturbed forest can have 140 dead logs per acre, and 10 to 20% of the forest canopy can be composed of snacks. We are going to look at why this is vital for a healthy forest within three broad categories, wildlife, plant life, and soil. An extensive range of creatures uses dead wood as home. Foraging grounds, storage units, meeting spaces, highways, and social space. For example, over a hundred species of birds and mammals rely on dead wood and tree snags as critical habitat. In North America alone, more than 80 species of birds nest in snags. Bluebirds, wood ducks, titmice, martins, great crested flycatchers, chickadees, nuthatches, barred owls, screech owls, and kestrels all depend on cavities for successful nesting. You may even be familiar with the chimney swift. Prior to the existence of chimneys on the landscape, large dead snags were often the nesting sites for chimney swifts. Bird species use snags in other ways besides nests. For example, to view their surroundings, watch for predators, prey, for rivals, to look for mates and to hunt, especially insects which both birds and bats are important insect predators. They also provide social space for birds, a place to communicate and meet up. For example, woodpeckers drum on hollow trunks to mark territories and to attract mates. The ruffled grouse uses fallen logs to drum their wings in a Birds of Paradise style dance, often returning to the same log on the forest floor year after year. Many animals move in after the birds. Think of it as a critter condo. For example, the holes pileated woodpeckers excavate allow access to flying squirrels, bats, raccoons, and many other species of bird. Large tree cavities, uprooted root wads, and fallen logs provide denning space for mammals such as rabbits, possums, fox, raccoons, wolves, bobcats, and even black bears, protecting them from harsh weather. These predators are helpful in controlling rodent and insect populations, as well as spreading the seed of our native trees. But how can a tree make a cavity large enough for a bear? Because the hollowing process in a tree is very specific. It has to begin early and start on a living tree. An already dead tree, not infected with heart rot fungus, will not become hollow. A hollow tree is created when the fungus invades the center or the heartwood of a living tree. As the tree spreads this disease vertically, the decay progresses to a point that the cylinder of dead wood eventually detaches from the surrounding layer of the tree and slumps downward. A hollow chamber results. Black bears find these and use them as den sites and the females and their young are much safer. Tree cavities are also used by frogs, snakes, honeybees, wasps, spiders, and aquatic invertebrates. Logs that fall into rivers, streams, and wetlands provide important habitat for trout, bass, turtles, and a wide variety of other aquatic species. These fallen logs become popular sites for fish to shelter and breed. Years later, a fallen snag becomes a nurse log where saplings find rich compost in which to grow as the decomposing logs enrich the soil. 
These groupings of logs may shelter young sapling trees from heavy browsing by deer or other animals, giving them a leg up. As they decay, the logs are colonized by plants and mosses, which host invertebrates such as tardigrades. Tardigrades are also lovingly known as moss piglets and water bears, and are tiny eight-legged micro-animals. These animals are found in harsh environments from mountaintops to the deep sea, volcanoes, tropical rainforests, and even the Antarctic. As you can imagine, being this versatile, tardigrades are among the most resilient animals known and used in scientific research. They have been shown to survive extreme conditions, such as broad temperatures, pressures, lack of oxygen, radiation, dehydration, and starvation. All of these extremes would kill most other forms of life. Tardigraves have even survived exposure to outer space. And these little moss piglets are prevalent in mosses and lichens and feed on plant cells, algae, and even other small invertebrates. This pioneer plant community and the tiny life it harbors may not have had the same chance at survival if it weren't for these nurse logs on which tree saplings and other plants are able to survive in. Dead and dying wood is like a time-released compost or fertilizer, which slowly releases nutrients into the soil. As they decay, the nutrients form the chemical and physical characteristics of forest soils. These characteristics are what makes healthy soil capable of producing old growth forests. This life cycle is fueled by the decomposing wood. An arc of plants to fungi and animals rely upon logs as a food source and a place to live. The fungus growing and fruiting on logs helps break down the wood, but also provides food for wildlife. Squirrels, chipmunk, deer, rabbits, and even humans eat mushrooms. The decomposing logs also help form mycorrhizae in the soil. These are basically fungus roots that form a symbiotic relationship with trees and help the plants share resources. More than 95% of terrestrial plant species form a symbiotic relationship with beneficial mycorrhizal fungi. And they have evolved this relationship over the past several hundred million years. These fungi are ancient, and they existed long before we had terrestrial plants like trees and grasses. This partnership allowed plants to colonize dry land and create life on Earth as we know it. This mycorrhizal relationship centers on a plant's ability to produce carbohydrates through photosynthesis. The plant shares the sugars it creates with the fungus in return for otherwise unavailable water and nutrients that are sourced from the soil. These fungal networks spiderweb through the soil and are called the wood wide web, allowing trees to communicate with each other, not through speech like we do, but by sending electrical signals to warn other trees about insect predators and passing along sugar, nitrogen, and phosphorus to other trees in need during periods of stress. Now that you know how important dead wood can be in a landscape, turn to your own home. How much healthy and unhealthy trees does your landscape have? Consider leaving the stump of your dead tree or cutting off the branches of a dead tree to leave it standing as a snag. Fallen trees can be cut up into logs and interplanted or stacked into a habitat wall. If you're in need of some inspiration on how to incorporate these elements in your own home, come visit the Stumperary Garden located on the Eastside Extension Beltline Trail in Reynoldstown.